Hello, thank you for being with us. I'm Bobby Donaldson, Professor of History and Director for the Center for Civil Rights History and Research at the University of South Carolina. On behalf of the Center and our co-sponsor, the South Carolina Collaborative on Race and Reconciliation, I wish to welcome you to this panel entitled From Civil Rights to Black Lives Matter, a conversation with civil rights veterans and young people who are engaged in the struggle today in South Carolina. We're very grateful to our panelists and our moderator for lending their voices to this important and powerful conversation. A conversation that is timely and necessary as we look around the world today. And also one that is timely and necessary as we remember civil rights activists and legends who've passed away in recent months. We remember Reverend Joseph Laurie, Willie Jamison Bowie, Herbert Lee Wright, Miss Connie Curry, Emma Sanders, Charles Evers, Dr. C.T. Vivian, and Congressman John Lewis, who as a young man was beaten in Rock Hill, South Carolina, as he participated in the Freedom Rides in May of 1961. As we honor civil rights workers who passed away, we also honor those who are still with us. And we shed light on those young workers today who carry on the tradition and legacy of activism. Dr. Cleveland Sellers Jr. and Ms. Doris D.D. Wright will share their wisdom and experiences drawn from decades of activism. Reared in Denmark, South Carolina, Dr. Sellers served as the program secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. In 1964, Dr. Sellers was active in Freedom Summer, where he coordinated voter registration campaigns, freedom schools, and helped organize the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. In the late 1960s, Dr. Sellers returned to South Carolina, advising and organizing on the South Carolina State College campus in Orangeburg. On the night of February 8th of 1968, State Highway Patrolman shot into a crowd of unarmed students, killing three and wounding countless others, including Cleveland Sellers. Responding to the tragedy, the Orangeburg Massacre, Governor Robert McNair blamed Sellers and other, quote, outside Black power agitators. Sellers, from nearby Denmark, was the only one who went to prison, convicted of spurious charges of inciting a riot. A lifelong educator, Dr. Sellers served as the director of the African American Studies Program at the University of South Carolina and as president of Voorhees College. Joining Dr. Sellers is Ms. Dee Dee Wright. Born in Greenville, Ms. Wright joined the movement at age 15 and served as president of the Youth Council of the Greenville NAACP and as secretary of the State Youth Council of the NAACP. As one of the Greenville Eight, she successfully challenged segregation of the Greenville Public Library 60 years ago in the summer of 1960. She also helped organize protests, including a state house demonstration in March of 1961. After she and 200 students were arrested at the march, she became one of the 187 plaintiffs in the landmark United States Supreme Court decision, Edwards versus South Carolina. After retiring to Salisbury, North Carolina, Ms. Wright served as the first African-American chairwoman of the city's planning board as a member of the executive committee of the NAACP and as the interim director of the Salisbury Rowan Community Service Council. Today, Ms. Wright and Dr. Sellers will participate in a conversation with three young activists from Empower SC, a collective of community members 
organizers, and activists whose mission is to battle racial inequities in South Carolina through community organizing, collaborative partnerships, and systemic policy change. Executive Director Rai Martinez was born and reared in Columbia. She graduated from the historic C.A. Johnson High School. The brutal murder of Trayvon Martin in 2012 compelled Rai to lend her voice and energies in activism. More recently, she created SC Protesters to unite activists across the Palmetto State. She co-founded Empower SC in the wake of the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Jasmine McCray is also a co-founder of Empower SC and its chief of operations. She graduated from the University of South Carolina in 2020 with a bachelor's in history. Currently, Jasmine is completing her master's in teaching degree at the university. Ryan Jasmine are joined by DJ Polite. He is the director of policy for Empower SC and a PhD student in history at the University of South Carolina, where his research is centered on race, empire, and citizenship in the Caribbean, with a particular focus on Puerto Rico. In addition to his work with Empower SC, DJ has served on the Southern Historical Association Graduate Council and as a clean energy organizing intern with the Sierra Club. Finally, we are extremely pleased that this program will be moderated by Alicia Barnes, an award-winning anchor and reporter with WIS-TV. A native of Atlanta, and a graduate of Clemson and Wayne State Universities, Alicia has covered pivotal stories, including the historic 2015 floods, the tragic shootings at Mother Emanuel in Charleston, and the removal of the Confederate flag from the South Carolina State House in 2015. These are just brief bios of our accomplished panelists. You will hear much more during this discussion. As our panelists speak today, we also would like to hear from you. We encourage you to submit your own questions. If you're joining us on Zoom, you may click the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to submit your question. If you're joining us on Facebook, you may submit your question as a comment on the video. Programs like today's conversation are only possible with your participation and generosity. To support the center's efforts of documenting, preserving, and promoting civil rights history in the present and in the past, we invite you to visit our website at www.civilrights.sc.edu. There you will find a button to make a donation to the center to continue the important work. With that, on behalf of the Civil Rights Center, and the South Carolina Collaborative on Race and Reconciliation. I wanna thank you for joining us for this important conversation entitled, From Civil Rights to Black Lives Matter. Moderated by our host, Alicia Barnes of WIS-TV. And thank you, Professor Donaldson, for that great introduction. Today, we have a very unique opportunity to bring two generations together, and that's why we call this conversation Civil Rights to Black Lives Matter. Now, if you hear the excitement in my voice, it's just because we have a wealth of knowledge on this panel, and it is just, I mean, just so amazing. I'm just so interested. I'm eager to hear what everybody has to say. I want to start by thanking our panel for being here today, but I also want to acknowledge everybody who is listening and who's watching because we could not have this conversation without you. Um, as we start, I kind of want to break down the three things that we hope to tackle with this conversation. First, we'd like to discuss how the current protests fit in context with the long movement for racial justice. Second, we want to touch on what activists of today can learn from the activists of the past. And then thirdly, we really want to discuss the landscape we're organizing and how it's changed in recent years. So I encourage our panelists to be able to jump right in with any insight. 
Um, today is all about learning, so we definitely want you to educate us. Uh, starting with Dr. Sellers and Ms. Wright, I have to say there's just not enough words to describe how thankful we are for your courage, your sacrifice, your wisdom, and your fight for your decades long fight, I should say, of social injustice. And we heard from Dr. Donaldson as he gave us the history of the Orangeburg massacre. So I'd really like to be able to start there. Uh, that happened on February 8th of 1968. Dr. Sellers, you were the only person arrested. As a result, you spent seven months in jail, uh, clearly a pivotal point of your legacy and your life. If you can first start off by talking about the period of the civil rights movement and give us some real context of the black freedom struggle and what really motivated you to keep going. Okay, I, I take this opportunity to talk about my life growing up in South Carolina. And first, let me just say that I grew up during the period of segregation. I was in school and uh, when I finished school, the University of South Carolina was still uh, segregated. Um, segregation was a, a, a um, real serious kind of issue for African Americans. It not only limited your opportunities, but it also had a psychological kind of dehumanization uh, attached to it processed, attached to it. And when I say that, I'm saying that uh, Blacks during that period of segregation had what we call segregated etiquette. And that would be set up by social policies that would prohibit Blacks from doing certain kinds of things a particular way. Um, and so those things were translated into laws also. So you ended up with, uh, with uh, policies, social policies, if I were to meet a, a young white uh, girl, uh, I would have to refer to her as Miss Mary or Miss Jane or Miss Alice uh, when there was no expectation for the white person to respond to me using anything but boy, uh, booger, whatever they chose to, to refer to you as. If I were to be walking down a sidewalk and if we're talking about places like Mississippi and South Carolina, if I were to come up on a white couple, I had to step down to the side, uh, get off the sidewalk and let them pass. Or if I walked up to them, I couldn't look at them eye to eye. I'd have to shift my eyes to their feet and I would have to pass them in that manner because eye to eye contact was considered to be belligerent and you have violated a social etiquette in the, the, the area, in the region. And therefore you could be arrested, you could be beaten, you could be harmed in some other way. Um, but when you were considered to be uh, unlawful or did not take those etiquettes seriously, that's when you were considered to be a, a problem that the law had to solve. Um, I say that because a lot of people don't know that. If I were to go to a white person's home, I would have to go through the back door, I'd go to the back door, knock on the door and let them come out and we would exchange whatever. Under no circumstances was I allowed to go to the front door. And if I did that, I was trespassing and that you could be arrested for trespassing based on that kind of thing. And for young people to, to recognize what it is, uh, we can talk about the fast food places and that is in the drive-through, if you go around to the drive-through area, there's a door back there which says employees only. That was the door that we had to go to if we wanted service from that restaurant. And we'd knock on the door and they would come and they would ask us what we want. We would give them a list, a hot dog and a Coke or whatever we wanted. And uh, we would give them the money. And then they would bring back the sandwiches in a paper bag and hand them to you. And you had to go find someplace, some area that you could sit down and eat. So it, it, it had a way of, of, of trying to dehumanize us, uh, or to see us as, as not being humans. And, and you kind of felt that and it made you feel uneasy. And it was really not good. It was crazy. The whole, the whole, the whole system was crazy. And it would make you crazy because then you get into the areas of talking about the atrocities that were committed, the lynchings, the, the, the just 
random violence that you would find when people tried to register to vote. Uh, to vote. And so um, I was uh, in a household that we had the Pittsburgh Courier, we had the Baltimore Afro, and we had the uh, Newport News German Guide. These were newspapers by black editors and black publishers and that kind of thing. And then we had Life Magazine and Jet Magazine. I so happened to receive the Jet Magazine that came through the mail. And on the cover of the Jet Magazine was this distorted head that was out of shape and disformed. And it was just a bad scene. And so one of the things that I did was I made an effort to, um, to, to talk about that and try to find out what happened. And I talked to my parents about it. And then I went to school and we talked about it at school. And our teachers talked to us about uh, how we had to take those things under consideration. That was a part of the reality, the racism and the violence and the segregation and oppression were there. And that as we grew up, we had to find ways in which we could bring about that kind of change that the question came up about whether or not we want to get even, whether or not we want to go down and, and, and shoot the people who, who killed Emmett Till. The answer was no. What we wanted to do was we wanted to build and we wanted to grow and we wanted to educate ourselves and we wanted to have the, the technical skills and the strategies and tactics to change a society that would allow a white, two white people to kidnap and, raw and, and uh, murder a 14 year old and then get exonerated. I mean, the, the jury stayed in for 45 minutes and came back with a not guilty verdict. And what it said was that no ang white Anglo-Saxon Protestant in Mississippi should be found guilty of killing a white, a black person in the state of Mississippi. That was the kind of general policy. So under any circumstances, that outcome was gonna be there. So we had to change the justice system we had to change the, the political system. We had to change the economic system. We had to change everything in order for black folk to have, to make a difference and have an opportunity to participate as the constitution guaranteed them the right to. And many people would say that Emmett Till of your generation would be the George Floyd of our generation, um, the Trayvon Martin. And um, last month with the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, it really pushed a lot of activists here in Columbia into leadership roles, planning more than just marches and protests. DJ, I really would like to bring you into the conversation now. You are a PhD student um, in history at the University, excuse me, at the University of South Carolina. So you've long had a history, not only of learning history, but you've also uh, been involved with political organizing. So I'd like to be able to hear your um, you elaborate on the same topic. So I, the thing about history and the way I approach it, uh, both as a learner and an active participant now, is I, I have to act with a certain humility, right? You know, I, I have my own grandmother, Barbara Jean Polite, um, from Greensboro, South, from Greensboro, North Carolina, originally. And, you know, she's a, an older woman with dementia now. And so, Unfortunately, I can't ask her a lot of the questions that I wish I could. But I think about the fact that like I had her in my life. And I think about the fact that I had the blessing of having my great grandmother in my life until she was 90 and I was 18. She was from South Carolina. And so thinking about history is like people think of history as being long gone, but what does it mean to have someone like me who's 30 now, who for the first 20 years of my life lived with someone born in the 1920s of the South. My grandmother now, still alive, call her every day, and still is moving, right? Still a part, active part of my life. And so I think about history, yes, as a way of learning the past, better understanding the life that my grandparents, my great-grandparents lived, and also understanding where they fit in the world in a way that perhaps I can't always get out in a conversation for one reason or another. And so when I think about where we are now and understanding the, this path of whether you want to call it the long civil rights movement or from civil rights to Black Lives Matter is we are all communities of people who are dealing with similar struggles. 
when my grandmother sees things going on right now, is not just like her past. It's like, well, that's a fight that I had and my grandson is having right now. Or when I think about, you know, my father, who is my namesake, or I'm his namesake, understanding that the struggles that he fought and he struggles with to this day are things that impacted the way he raised me. And it's going to impact the way I raised my son as a young black boy now. And so history is living. I've always understood that in the way that I study it and the way that I practice it and the way that I organize is that live, history is living because the people who live through history are still living themselves. As we can see from Dr. Sellers, as we can see from Dee Dee Wright, as we can see from communities in which, that we, in which we live and the people that we actually have shared our lives with. Can anybody address the lack, I should say, thereof, of addressing the systemic racism over time? Well, I, I think that there have been efforts made to do that, but what we find is, is that the key to ending racism uh, in America is going to rest with the progressive element of the, of the, of the uh, majority community. Um, because it, it is the movement, starting with the Montgomery bus boycott all the way through, that talked about expanding the rights and opportunities of the poor, the rights and opportunities of the disenfranchised, the rights and opportunity. For an example, when we talk about the disenfranchised, we're talking about women. And we find that women use the same basic model as gays and, and, and lesbians, same basic model of the civil rights movement to struggle, to protest, to have demonstrations, et cetera, to get legislation passed in order for them to open up those opportunities. So I think that we can keep raising the issue, but we can't continue to, to have the examples that we show. We don't need to have to show uh, George Floyd. We, 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 we shouldn't be there now. We, we should be, you know, we have, we have had a, a lot of minorities that are in Congress and those kinds of places, and we always end up kind of going in a circle. Not that history goes in a circle, but we go in a circle. And so we start out with a, a 1965 civil rights bill, and, and today there is no bill that covers of, I'm sorry, voting rights bill, there is no bill, a law that covers uh, protecting the rights of minorities and African American and women to vote any, any longer. And so we keep kind of going forward. And as we go forward, then the next thing that happened is there's a backlash. And then what there is, is there's an attempt to marginalize and minimize the efforts on the part of, let's say, Black Lives Matter, of uh, that generation of activists who are centered around Black Lives Matter now. And they have to be prepared for that because it is coming. And I just think about it in terms of myself. And I think about it how uh, some people have, have made an effort to talk about, um, uh, let's say, um, what is it? What is it? My thought, my thought, I got it. Burn, okay. baby, burn. That was the, that was what a sled officer testified that I did in Orangeburg, not on the night that I was arrested, but two nights before that. And they had removed all the other charges. I mean, they had grand lodging and assault with intent to kill and all that kind of, that's, how I was arrested. I was the only person arrested. They had me on conspiracy to ride and incitement to ride. It was a kangaroo court, clear. And so what they use was they use burn baby burn because what that does is that create the imagery in the minds of whites of Watts in 1965. And that the, the whole idea about um, um, burn Baby Burn was a, a title topic that was used by the press to talk about, um, uh, talk about Watts. 
and what, what went on in, in Watts. And so now I find that, you know, the state of South Carolina has already used that on me, that all I was about was burn, baby, burn, and therefore all of the people in SNCC that uh, went on to do all kinds of things and make all kinds of changes are now referred to if, if they didn't leave uh, SNCC at the point where John Lewis stepped down from the, uh, the, the organization, then um, uh, they are a part of that burn, baby, burn, and that black power. And we get all that intermeshed. But we have to recognize that Obama was a product of burn, baby, burn. Doug Jones, in his election for senator, it was the Black Panther Party. Uh, and they are now called the, the uh, Democratic Party in Lowndes County, Dallas County, and, and, and um, Wilcox County. Those were the areas that SNCC went in and began to organize those communities. And those were the communities that turned up after the, all, most of the ballots had been counted. And they were overwhelmingly Black, and they were overwhelmingly for Doug Jones. And I'm just saying that we miss it. We, we miss it. We slide to the side because people find reasons to talk about black power. Black power is no danger. I mean, it doesn't have violence or nonviolence attached to it. It is the reality that black folk have to come together and they have to begin to form it just like they're doing now in Congress. You have the minority caucus in Congress. You have the African-American caucus. You have all these caucuses that come together for the purpose of de developing an agenda and pushing that through in order to get relief on healthcare expansion and all those kinds of things that are denied in, in a state like South Carolina, we have to find a way in which we can actually utilize that. But we also have to work with our young people and get our history straight and correct. Because right now there are a lot of people going around and talking about history and they are not they are not accurate in that depiction and so i don't want people to be revisionists and thinking that they are talking about you know this this dynamic of individuals and we also destroy to some extent the myth about a leader in our community we have to wait on another dr king or we have to wait on another john lewis everybody in SNCC was a part of the SNCC family we loved, we encouraged, we supported, and we did everything we could to help out. We had a policy that said if somebody was killed or wounded or arrested or whatever it is and his project was going down, then what you would have to do is you would have to send a team in there within four hours, a new team that was set up in the office, out in the field, talking to community people. And the other thing is, is that the basis of any kind of movement has to be grassroots. That has to be the group that is organized and move forward. And when you take the, the grassroots, you're also talking about students and young people being a part of that particular effort. But organizing, just, organizing, just organizing. young people in on that part of the conversation. Yeah. I didn't mean to cut yeah. you off, Dr. I'm, Sellers. I'm, I'm, Jasmine, I'm, I'm doing no, no, we, we want to hear this, want to hear this. But Jasmine and Ron, yeah. I also see that you guys have something to say. You're both with Empower SC as well as DJ is. Explain to us what fighting for civil rights in Columbia looks like and how do you plan to sustain the momentum that has already been created? Yeah, in Columbia, we, we've come to, everybody has joined to work together. Um, from community to community, we have all joined hands um, against that battle um, for, again, to, to fight the battle against racism. Um, we must stay consistent in that. Um, taking, taking breaks um, is when we have that chance for people to forget what we're doing. So we don't wanna take breaks. Uh, we wanna continue to be involved. That includes giving back to the community. That includes providing resources. And that includes um, standing against the policy that has put in place um, to divide us. And we have learned that from Dr. Sellers um, and Mrs. Wright. We've learned that staying consistent will get you to the ultimate goal. Um, and that's beating down the walls 
the walls of racism. In Colombia, we are unapolog unapologetic with our approach. We will continue to break down these walls that divide us. Um, and we'll do that without being sorry. We will continue to make good trouble in Colombia. As John Lewis always says, make good trouble. Uh, Jasmine, did you want to say anything on this topic? Yeah, I think it's really important as South Carolinians to know our place in history um, and the grand narrative for civil rights. I think our state is largely written off. Um, we're largely forgotten for our contributions, despite the work of greats like Dr. Sellers and Dee Dee Wright or Sarah Mae Fleming, who stepped off, uh, stepped off and said no on a bus before Rosa Parks. We forget the great history that we have right down on Main Street. We forget that incredible Black women like Miss Wright were arrested on our state house grounds for us to continue this fight right now. And that's something that I think all South Carolinians need to remember. Dr. Donaldson reminded us that John Lewis stepped foot in Rock Hill and was beaten in, Rock, in, in front of the Greyhound station. History happened here and we need to embrace it. We need to reconcile with it. And we need to lead that charge in the South and across the state um, and across the country. Jasmine, let's stay with that. Miss Wright, I want to bring you into the conversation now. You've seen the Confederate flag go up. You've seen it go down. Um, I really want to be able to get your insight, but I first want to bring our viewers and listeners up to speed. If you can just um, let me talk about your history in terms of your fight against discrimination for a moment. Uh, in March 2nd of 1961, you were among almost 190 civil rights demonstrators arrested at the South Carolina State Capitol here, right here in Columbia, and you were thrown in jail overnight. Uh, you were given dog food to eat. Uh, a month later, that's when South Carolina, you know, South Carolina leaders raised the Confederate flag above the State House dome to mark the Civil War's 100th anniversary in April of 1961. Mm -hmm. On July 10th, we all know, of 2015, that's when the Confederate flag was removed from the State House grounds, ending its 54-year presence at the Capitol. So I read an article in the Salisbury Post uh, that you watched an honor guard take down the Confederate flag. Very emotional, you had tears, and you made this statement, quote, it was bittersweet, it was a bittersweet day because you felt sorry for protesters who didn't fully understand the history of the flag they were trying to save. So I want you to educate us. Um, I want you to give more context of what that quote meant first. I think, first, thank you so much. Um, I think first of all, if there's an adage that says, if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. So, when the flag went up uh, after we were arrested, it was, um, it said to me, the flag, I have a whole different mindset relative to the Confederate flag. To me, whenever I hear white people talking about the Confederate flag and their heritage, I just merely say, um, you lost the war. You know, you don't have to get into a whole dialogue about um, that flag. And they, uh, most of them do not know from whence they've come. Being in a, in a movement, one sit-in, I've often said, does not make a movement. And when I look at what is happening in Columbia, South Carolina, I think our activities in the civil rights movement is passing the baton to a Rye, to a DJ, to a Jasmine, to know although you, get, you have the baton, it's a relay and it's a marathon. So when I see images like, like that, and I think the other thing that we, we have to learn to do, white people are forever studying our history. Just think about that. They know everything about us, but we don't know anything about them. We can talk about the atrocities, of how they hung us, uh, how we were given, they thought was inferior education. But having gone to a black high school, black elementary school, a black college, I would put my education, my education above any white school. 
So I think when when we when we start to uh, weave this fabric and 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 making a quilt that would cover us all, that I would say to Jasmine and I would say to to Rye and to DJ, you you must focus. You you have to focus on where you you're going. When we marched on the Capitol steps, and unbeknowing that history did not record it, that we were met by Strong Thurmond, who was very proud to say that he had a Negro daughter who went to South Carolina State College. Mm -hmm. So then you start to wonder what is going on. He never denied his Black daughter, as he said. So watching the flag go up and down, that was something to, to distract. You got to remember, you cannot you cannot be distracted by what they're saying. You got to know what it is that you're doing. So, when when I say that they don't know their history, they really don't know their history. They they're just making up things, and they don't want to get to the meat of what is going on. I have a meeting tomorrow with two uh, white guys who want to talk about the same thing, but I want to hold them accountable to how did you get to where you're going? You see, we can't always let it be about us. We have to let it be about them sometimes and what they have done and how they're doing it and how we're not gonna allow them to continue to abuse, to use, and to disenfranchise us as we go about this journey of, of equal rights fighting for what it is that we want. We have to look at policy. Policy is very important. Because whenever you say anything, what I have found in, in my acculturation, when you use a word, then they will, make, they will take that word and take every meaning. If in a dictionary, if it has seven meanings, they will use all seven meanings as opposed, why are you laughing, Jazz? Because that is what they do. So we have to learn how they think. It's we have true. to learn how they think. And we cannot let them off the hook. Mm -hmm. Yes, pick up on that. Could I pick up on that just a little bit? You sure can, Dr. Sellers. I have a uh, civics book that was South Carolina history, and I had it when I was in the seventh or eighth grade. I'm not sure. And in that book, it talks about the period of Reconstruction, and it talks about how the uh, the, the the vote had been issued to black people and that black people were like children playing hooky while the teacher's back was turned. They talked about um, how uh, black people stole and burned bonds and stole cattle and chickens and all that kind of stuff. And then they said that white people banded together and they organized the Ku Klux Klan. And the Ku Klux Klan got on their fast white horses, galloped through the black communities, scaring black folk into, to, uh, into superstition. And I'm just saying that I couldn't believe it, that I had actually had that. And that's the Sims book on South Carolina history. And it goes on to talk about other kinds of things, demeaning things about African Americans during that period of, of Reconstruction. But it says that the, the new generation of young white students had to fight for maintaining uh, white power in South Carolina. And, and I'm just, I mean, I'm flabbergasted by that. My point is, is that there is a conscientious effort to deny and delete and distort the history of African Americans in South Carolina. There is a conscious decision to do that. Orangeburg Massacre is an example. I mean, there are so many parallels to the George Floyds and to the, 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 the brutality and, and murder by police officers. And it was the South Carolina State Highway Patrolman that went up on the campus of South Carolina State. No, they went across the fence and, and people weren't charging at them and they didn't have any alternative. They had lethal weapons and they shot at young people as young as uh, 17 years old. 
on the campus of South Carolina State killing three young men and wounding, we think, around 40 other additional people. I was one of the ones who was shot. And, but I was charged with having that ride because they were able to connect me in some funny manner to burn baby burn. Dr. Sellers, I have been asked on numerous occasions in terms of people feeling the diversity of protesters in today that they, um, of, of what it looks like. But when I talk to people from the civil rights movement, they say that when you look at white and black protesters, it mirrored from the 50s and 60s. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, even, I believe, I can't, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but the original Freedom Riders, I believe um, there were three or four that were white. Can you just talk about that so people can put that into context? Yeah, well, first we can go back to the sit-ins, and the sit-ins started at, at North Carolina A&T College in Greensboro. It was four young men that started out on the sit-ins, and then the number got larger each day after that as the, um, the students, the four students were called in by their president, and he had been called by the governor of North Carolina, and he said, "Quash those demonstrations. He called him into the um, into the um, into his office, Wama T. Gibbs, and they asked him. Uh, no, though he asked them, were they all participants in this civil rights movement, and was this for social change? And and they said yes, and he turned around to the window behind him. And he said, the governor called and said that I was supposed to tell you all, um, you know, that you all needed to cool it and back down and not have these demonstrations because it caused so much upheaval and so much potential for violence and that kind of thing. And they said that they were nonviolent. And he stayed at the room and said, well, that's the end of our meeting. And he didn't, that's what he told them. He told them exactly what the governor had said. And they went back and the next day they had three times as many people. Now, the point is, is that as the movement kept getting larger and larger, the uh, students from Bennett College began to join in with the students from A&T. And then they had a, a North, University of North Carolina College for Women, and white students from that college began to join in. And at that point, the, um, the, um, the, the, the uh, thugs that would go down and challenge them and, and push them and shove them or pull some sugar in their head or whatever it is, spit on them, kick them and that kind of thing, they said that they were coming down and there wasn't gonna be a demonstration on the next day. And so on the next day, the sit-iners all came in and then the doors opened, flew open, and the entire a and football team in their jerseys came down and, and got around the wall, the outer, wall, all, outer edges of the wall, and said nothing. They were just there quiet, nothing. And those young men who were threatening left the area all completely. And as the sit-ins continued to move down I-85 to Salisbury and then to Charlotte and then down I-77 into South Carolina, all the HBCUs along that way joined in with their own type of protests. That's how I got involved because it came to a small town of Denmark, South Carolina, which is where I was raised, but I was going to high school on a college campus, Voorhees College campus. And the sit-ins got there and, and, and did that kind of thing. But even before you get there, you have to understand who the sit-ins were. There were students who risked everything. Some, their mama and auntie S Essie May and, and Uncle John, they all put their little resources together to get that student to school. So they didn't know what the consequences were. The consequences could have been they were put out of school. That would have been the worst thing in the world because that's their opportunity to get from under that 
uh, um, sharecropping system and picking cotton and doing all those other things for little or no money at all. Um, just interrupt, please. Let me let me interrupt you there. Okay. Because I you just hit on a very important point for me, for young folk who are out with Black Lives Matter today, and Dr. Sellers just talked over just kind of briefly, but I think it needs to be underscored that if you're going to go out and lead a movement, you got to understand the risk that are involved, not only for you and 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 your physical health but for your family and even for your progeny. You know, we were run, my sitting in, in South Carolina, my family, we were run out of South Carolina. So these are kind of risks you have to take. And, right. and rather than to get out there and, and, and provide a number, it's, it's not about the number, it's about how important you think it is to see laws change, policy change, and all, you, you have to have a specific goal in mind to be able to achieve what it is that, that you're looking for. I mean, it's, it's, I can't stress enough the importance of what you're doing. I saw an article in the state newspaper on you, Ryan and Jasmine. I, I think the only thing I would say to you, just be sure, be sure that this is, is how you want to roll in the vernacular, how you want to roll yes. and what it is that you want to do. That's because right. no matter what, people's minds, they have long memories, those who, who tend to want to oppress. And you can look 10 years down the road, and I heard the introduction, you're majoring in education, and you may want to go into the school to teach. And then when they do the background check on you, they'll find a reason not to hire you. So. I think I didn't mean to interrupt you, Cleve, like that, but I, I think it's really important uh, to, to stress that each day you go out there and you're, you're talking about Black Lives Matter, admirable, I love it, it's a movement. You saw at the beginning, I put on my, my mask for you to let you know that I, I support you 100%. But know that each day, even here today, as, as we talk, somebody is watching you and somebody is going to be there to say no to you and you got to be able to explain why you're doing what you're doing and and how you want to achieve it i'm sorry uh cleve i didn't mean to you're doing, a, no. you're doing a perfect job <laughs> that's right I, that was exactly on point because that's the whole purpose of this conversation is right. for the young activists to be able to learn from those of the past I do want to mention at this point, though, because we are living in a painful and courageous season where the feeling of being uncomfortable, I say, is necessary. And just from listening to everybody, you can be able to tell that that's true. I've asked numerous people of very different backgrounds to describe how they're feeling in 2020. And I just want to read some of those uh, to everybody. So this may include the people who are listening and are, are watching. People say they feel suffocated. They feel hurt. They feel confused. Many are trying to understand the cognitive dissonance that is pervasive in this world, the mental stress, the unease, the discomfort. Many have said they feel attacked. Many see racism subtle and blatant at the same time. Many just don't understand. Many are tired. Some would rather just stay away and tell themselves that they don't see racism. And with that being said, more people now are stepping up that never even thought to protest. People that even, you know, said, hey, I know that something needs to be done. So with what you're saying, Ms. Wright, I think that is a great pearl of wisdom right there when you said be prepared for what you're doing now. If you can elaborate even more, this is where we really want to be able to gain your, what you want to give us. I think we were, we were sitting in at the lunch counters um, in Greenville, South Carolina, you go to a lunch counter and, and you know the history that they don't serve, well, Negroes, African-Americans, whatever we were being called at the time. We know that. So you can't go sit at the lunch counter because who knows, somebody in, in H&L Green's F.W. Woolworth would have decided, well, well let's, let's give them a milkshake. But then you, it, you serve the milkshake and you don't have any money. So you got to have money in your pocket. And I see where somebody was talking about 
well, do they have money uh, for bail? This has to be, it has to be a part of your strategy because everybody will go out there and protest. But if, if you're going to decide, if the police says you need to break this up, unlawful, if you don't, we're going to arrest you. Well, you just can't say I'm going to go to jail. How are you going to get out of jail? There has to be a plan. You just can't go out there and provide the bodies and, and provide the, the, the loudest noise. There has to be a strategy. When we sat in at the library, the first time when I was arrested at the, uh, at the library, there had been two other protests there. Rather than uh, let us in the library, they shut the library down. So you have to go back and, and, and re-identify and identify what it is that you're looking for. Are you looking for a book? Are you looking for attention? What is it that, I can't, I can't stress it enough. You, you just can't. And, and your families, I've been often asked, well, how did your mother feel? How did your family feel that you were out there demonstrating? Well, I didn't say anything. I just did it. I just did it. And for me, I was very lucky until I got to stay in jail overnight. That was no fun. But you got to be able to, to identify Bell's bondsman, who's going to pay your bond, whether they're going to let you out, whether they're trying to teach you a message. All of this thing that we talk about relative to civil rights and Black Lives Matter, there's really no difference. The difference I see now is that you have more white kids joining because that's their culturation. They've gone to school with you. They know you. So they're willing to fight with you. So for us, I mean, with John Lewis, there was some freedom riders and a very interesting case of, uh, on John Lewis, the state laws on race and color by Pauli Murray is a very interesting book in looking at inter interstate commerce. So you have to do your research. You just can't go in the moment. You just can't go in the moment. I can't stress that enough. All right, I'm gonna piggyback on you since you piggyback on me. And you okay. might have some more thoughts after I finish. But um, I think about the fact that as organizers, and that's what you are trying to become first, because you're gonna have to organize the masses of African Americans. And you have to have a humility that goes along with that. But most importantly, when we started out with sit-ins and all that kind of freedom rides and all that kind of thing, we put ourselves in danger, okay? But now, when I went to Mississippi at nine, 19 years old, I had to go into communities where I knew there was going to be a reprisal for people trying to register to vote. So it was important for me to understand Emmett Till and, and kind of bring that in. If I'm going to do something, uh, we're on a serious level now. We're talking about people's lives and all those kinds of things. And the, the reality was that the only thing I could tell them was I would go to the courthouse with them, but that I couldn't promise them that their home would be there when they got back, uh, that they would have a job, uh, uh, their children, something would happen to their children. And so I made an, I, you know, I made an effort of going through that. But let me tell you what happens when uh, people start taking those things as, oh, that was just a lock. People was just doing some things. Uh, John Strowman over at, um, at South Carolina State, who um, was a part of the initial demonstrations before the shooting at, on the campus of South Carolina State. He went into a business, it was a black owned business, might have been a barbershop in Orangeburg. And the, the person who was proprietor of that building knew John Strowman. So he was trying to introduce John Strowman to the, the person that was in the chair. And what he said was, you don't know John Strowman? He said that that is the man that had those kids in that demonstration that got killed. And it was said in the manner that he was responsible for it. And John said his heart dropped all the way to his feet when somebody came up and did that kind of thing to you. 
and, and, and that happens. And so you have to recognize when you take somebody else's life and their children's life and, and uh, put it on the line, that you have to be serious because that question will come up and you will have to answer it. Are we doing something about humanity, something larger than us? And it has to go down this street. It just got to go down the street. People have to stand up and take control of their own lives and their own destiny. And that's- Right, I wanna bring you in on the conversation right now because with you being the executive director of Empower SC, um, is that, how do you prepare? Yes. Um, I agree with Dee Dee Wright and Dr. Sellers. Um, I have thought to myself over and over, is this what I want? Is this what I want? And I've come to the conclusion, it's not only what I want, but it's what I'm going to do and continue to do because I have been or will be and continue to be the person that has, that will step forward for my community, my fellow brothers and sisters um because some people cannot step forward some people cannot they may have a job that they may lose right. they may have friends that they may lose and for them i'm not judging them that may be important to them that may be important um so i have decided to prepare myself for these things things may happen but i will get back up and i hope that me stepping forward does not make my two daughters um, scared. Instead, I hope that it makes them proud. Proud that their mom not only fought for them as, as little black girls growing up in South Carolina and in the South of the United States, but I'm fighting for their friends and their husbands one day. I'm fighting for their kids and I'm fighting for my neighbor's child and I'm fighting for your child and I'm fighting for the for the kids of um, those who don't agree with me because I hope that one day, even if they don't understand it, their children understands and our children are able to play together. And if not, then maybe our grandchildren are able to play together. So um, I'm prepared for it. Um, you don't know what's coming to you. You don't know what's coming at you. But when it comes, I'll be here. Um, I'll be here to stand back up um, after yeah, something. Else. Okay. Would you guys like to get in on this part of the conversation? Jazz, you can go first. I'll let you go first. So, you know, I think about, and I mentioned some of my, my family. Um, my oldest great grandmother, um, Sylvia Polite, she also had dementia. And I would think about, one of the, la the the last conversation I had with her before I went to college, um, she had been in a uh, nursing home for a while, and her memory had gone for a long time. And so most of the time when I had seen her, she couldn't recognize me at that point. But the last time I saw her before I left for college, it was five minutes where like all her memory came back, and it was one of the the most beautiful memories I have of her. And you know, I told her like Sylvie. I, I would call my great grandmother by, by her first name, Sylvie. You know, I'm going to college and she was so proud. And the last thing she said to me before, like I saw her eyes glaze over and she forgot who I was in that moment. The last thing she said to me was, DJ, be a good boy like you've always been. And so I think about that over and over again. And what that means to me is, of course, if I'm doing the right thing, if I believe that what I am doing is for the right purpose, I, I live a lot by Isaiah 58, where it talks about fasting and people say, well, I'm fasting. What, what am I doing? Like, why am I not getting what I ask for, what I pray for? And, and Isaiah 58 talks about, it's like, did I ask you to suffer for a show or did I ask you to lift up the yoke of oppression from all those who, who feel that? And when you do that, when you feed the hungry, when you lift up the yoke of the oppressed, then I will answer your call. And so I think about, yes, what am I willing to suffer? Am I willing to lose a job? Am I willing to put my family at risk? I mean, I talk to my family and they're willing to bear that risk because they came from nothing. And I'm not afraid of going back to where good people have already been. 
what, what, what am I afraid of? It's like, I'm losing the job so I can start from where my grandfather was, my grandfather who didn't finish high school and is a good man. Am I afraid of that? Am I afraid to not have a home? Shoot, I'm the first family, first member of my family to have a home. Am I afraid of not having money? Most of my family is broke. I will not be afraid to do the right thing to return back to where my family has already been and pushed from because being good is the bar for me personally. Jasmine. That was just beautiful DJ and honestly uh, resonates pretty much with what I want to say is I was taught to be good. I was taught to speak up for what was right. Um, I walked along the streets knowing I bear a great privilege and not having dark skin and being able to pass and being biracial and having a white family and black family. Um, and that gives me a power, a weapon that can be wielded, um, but should be always wielded for good. And that was what my father um, taught me, what my grandmother continues to teach me. Um, and I'm willing to make the sacrifice um, to make sure that my black sisters and brothers can walk the street safe, that they can go to school and know that they are getting the same quality education, the same treatment as their white students are too. I'm willing to make these sacrifices because I know I have a privilege in my education, a privilege in my, in my skin tone, a privilege in my class that can be wielded and be used as a platform to speak out for others who are marginalized and who cannot fight because they are at risk. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to amplify. I'm just the megaphone. When I was reading out how people felt who I've spoken to where we are in present day, I could see some of you nod, some of you smile, some of you like really it hit home because you had heard similar things. I feel like I've had so many conversations with people about race mm -hmm. to get them to understand the just really understand the core and, and trying to put things into context. So I'm asking you, especially to our, our younger activists, what have those conversations been like on your end? Have you, have you, do you feel what I'm saying? Do you understand that I just feel like these, these conversations, it's like you, you don't want to stop because it might be that one conversation that helps somebody to get it. But at the same time, you just feel like it takes so much out of you to explain the systemic injustice that has been going on that now you have these big major companies like Amazon and Bank of America to say, oh, you know what, we now, we, you know what, it has been going on and now we're going to give some money. And so it's almost like it makes you feel in so many different emotions. I want you guys to talk about that. Yeah, um, we are here to, <clears throat> to educate. One thing is, I remember when I was younger, um, they would teach about that. And then as I got older, I started to forget the history of civil rights, forget, the, forget about the movement. I had to re-educate myself because they were taking it out of the schools. So what today's leaders need to always do is first and foremost, educate. So that when we do pick up and go um, out to march or go in front of the state house and hold up signs that our fellow protesters know why we the reason that we're there um, and they need to know what the sign means we we put a few words on the sign but really it means it means a paragraph it's it's an essay that just couldn't fit on that one poster the reality is we do have to educate the person beside us um, well, I think it's such a very good point because like for myself, I had to learn more about civil rights and the movement out of school than I did when I was in school. And I don't think, I don't think uh, the older generation really understand or really, really get how much of that that we're not getting in school. 
So I think that you're absolutely right because when you have conversations with people from the, the 60s and the 50s about the civil rights movement, a lot of times they start the conversation here where the conversation needs to be starting here to give us the, the good foundation as to what they're talking about. But yes. I think, finish, I'm sorry. I think uh, also when you're looking at Dr. Sellers, oh, no. I'm sorry, Ms. Wright, Ms. Wright, the civil rights movement vis-a-vis -vis, um, Black Lives Matter. I think that there really is not, a, the difference is that you have more um, electronics to be able to monitor what one is doing as opposed to the other things that used, used to be done. But I, I, I want to say that um, as, as, as you go about your movement, whatever it is, you don't have to be seen as, quote, the leader. Leadership comes when it comes. Uh, I'm hearing on television now, who's gonna fill John Lewis's shoes? Nobody can fill anybody's shoes. You have to believe in doing that which you believe that is right and righteous. That which you, you talk, uh, uh, Rod, that you had two children, your progeny, that, that's important. And also you, DJ, and, and Jazz, you're coming from a, a mixed family. You know, that can be a curse and a blessing. So you have to learn how to use that to your advantage and how you can help who you need to help. Um, I had mentioned earlier about uh, a book on Polly Murray, and I would just really, uh, I'll give you the title. I think I have it written here, State Laws on Race and Color. It's a very uh, uh, interesting read. So when you start to do your research, people say, why are you out here marching? You need to have an answer for that. You don't need to have an answer, but you should have an answer for that. So you're going out here, you're risking your life, and, and life is short and it's fragile. And I have a mantra, and I've had it for years and years and years, and it's one of the turtle. I wear a turtle every day. And in life, you have to take risks. You only move ahead by sticking your neck out. And, and, and if you can embrace that and, 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 and move with it, because it is a risk. It is a risk. And if anything that I have done over the years, not only in South Carolina, I can remember uh, protesting in Charleston, South Carolina during the Easter uh, holidays. And they sh we shut the department stores down because we weren't getting the service that we needed. Uh, going to Atlanta, going to school in Atlanta and how you get involved in those kinds of things. And I think the funny thing I wanna say, don't get caught up in thinking that politics is bad because everything we do in life is governed by politics you can't even be born unless you have a political piece of paper you can't even die unless you have a political piece of paper so as you look at the political end of it use it to your advantage i think that would be the most important thing that i would want to say to you that Look at policies, look at how these laws are affecting you, how they will affect your children, how they, what will happen? What is it that you want? What is it, you have to define that. You can't go out and lead people and not know where you're going. I mean, when, when John Lewis left SNCC, he knew what he wanted to do. He wanted to take a path of, of, of um, nonviolence. So when, when I'm watching what's happening in Portland, Oregon, they had the militia up there, and but yet when black men showed up with their guns, there was a whole different attitude. You mm -hmm. have to meet people where they are. So, so that's all. Yeah, well, and I, on I, that I, note, we're going to invite uh, our audience in right now. Jennifer, okay. I'm going to open up with questions and answers. We have hit our time of our conversation, but we want to continue this conversation and hopefully still um, get some feedback with our Q&A. Jennifer, if you want to start. Sure. I'm going to read out some of the questions that we've gotten. Um, I did have a bit of a technological difficulty and I got kicked out for a minute. So if you asked your question um, in the first half hour of our conversation, if you could resubmit it, that would be great. Um, first, we have a question from Lynn Hutto um, and it's to the younger generation. Many organizations advocating for equal civil and economic rights in this community have struggled financially. Do you all have a long-term plan for sustainability to quote, carry the baton for justice as this is a continuation of the marathon that will continue uh, for many years forward? I would Lost say, uh, oh, did someone else? I'm sorry. 
No, I'm sorry. That was me waving my husband not to bring the kids in. I apologize for that. Um, right now, as Empower, we're kind of still working on the financial sustainability uh, aspect. All of us are working here for free out of, the, out of just the passion that we have for this work, which makes it easier. Um, I, I want to bring up the incredible work that Soda City Bail is doing to take care of protesters who are jailed or imprisoned for protesting in Colombia. Um, there are incredible networks of bail, bail teams throughout the state and throughout this country that have been doing this work to ensure that people are taken care of. I want to mention the fact that Venmo and Cash App have been great resources for activists who are in need. Um, they literally will just post it in the kindness of people that want to see this movement continue. It, it comes out of love, it comes out of their wallets. Um, I think without money, this movement would continue though. You don't have to have money to continue these conversations. You don't need to have money to go march on the state house grounds. You can continue the social pressure without a checkbook without a thousand dollars in your your account like I am. So um, <laughs> Jasmine, it's really about passion. Jasmine, you sound exactly like me when I got started. And then SNCC came in and said they were going to rescue me. So they decided to give us $9.64 a week. And that's when they had it, which wasn't very often. So I went through six years and, you know, I, I have eaten, uh, bologna and cheese sandwiches, peanut butter and cheese, peanut butter and cheese, you know, not sandwiches, just peanut butter, you understand? But yeah. we, lived with, we lived in the communities, and so they would always help out, but you had to work. I got some beans down there, but you got to go pick them. Mm -hmm. You know, I got, I got some uh, squash and all that kind of stuff, but it creates a bonding. And it creates, helps you develop that kind of humility that you will need in order for you to uh, do your work. And you feel so good when you find that even a small thing that you were trying to do has come into fruition. And you have to, you have to remember that and you have to keep that in mind, that it's not going to be easy. There are sacrifices that you have to make, but you have to keep your eyes on the prize and hold on. That's what you have to do. Jennifer, you want to give us another one? Sure. So the another question we have is from Facebook, um, from LJ. Uh, what policies um, are Empower SC focusing on? And that is to the to the Empower SC activists. And then for the veterans on our panel, for Dr. Sellers and for Ms. Wright, um, what do you all think of those policies? Okay. Um, some of the policies that we're focusing on uh, would be the Racial Justice Act, um, which would put, which would give uh, Black and Brown people the opportunity to fight a charge if they feel that it was racially racially motivated with the consequences. So if they got 20 years and they know that if they were white, or say if they said they were Black, if, if they mentioned that and they didn't need to mention it at the sentencing, um, then we would know that's racially motivated. Um, and so that act does help them with that. Another thing is um, juvenile life without parole, that speaks for itself. Um, we just feel like we've all done things as kids that we wish we had a second chance with and every child should at least have a second chance. Uh, we don't think that locking them up and throwing away the key is the answer to that. Um, and maybe, on release, they could have some type of program that could correct their behavior. Um, and just two other ones are the silver, silver um, asset forfeiture, and um, they are trying to bring back the execution chair in, in South Carolina. Uh, we wanted to prevent that as well. So those are policies that we are um, against right now. Um, and I do just want to state that South Carolina does have a dark history of executing our young Black people. And I just want to, George Stinney, for, for an example, um, that was an example of if we had these policies, if we did not have these policies that we're fighting against um, in place and put some of the policies that we have suggested in those places instead, 
we'll be able to prevent that from happening again. So those are just a few. And Jasmine, I know that you wanted to talk about um, how you're working on the Heritage Act and getting that repealed. If you want to mention that just briefly. Yeah, um, another initiative I'm working on is uh, pushing for repealing the Heritage Act and making sure we can actually have the local power needed to remove statues such as Wade Hampton's or <laughs> Andrew Jackson's or my personal nemesis, J. Marion Sims. Um, these are ones that I have passed as a USC student um, that are cherished and beloved on our buildings, that our first black woman, Honoree Monteith, had to reside in. And it's wrong that it requires a legislator who doesn't reside in that town, who doesn't go to that campus, to remove a statue. And recently it's been called unconstitutional, yet we're still waiting to see what can possibly be done to actually repeal it. We have a huge uh, petition that has now over 100,000 signatures across South Carolina. So there is a demand to see this. We've seen the flag get off the dome, Miss Dee Dee Wright. We saw Bree Newsom Bass take that flag down. I want to emphasize that it wasn't the state's decision to remove that flag. It was a black woman's decision to crawl up that pole and remove it because she was tired of it. And I'm tired of it too. And I don't have the power to remove every single one of these monuments. So I'm doing it with a petition and trying to do it the right way. Um, however, it, it's time to really rewrite our history. And that starts with just our public history too and what we see and what we commemorate. We should have statues for Dr. Sellers and Dee Dee Wright and the Orangeburg Massacre. We should commemorate these people. Sarah Mae Fleming is not commemorated on our grounds, yet we have J. Marion Sims enshrined with busts and buildings, and that needs to change. Jennifer, is there another question? I think we have time for two more. I just, can I just mention a couple of that for? Um, two things that I really wanted to also emphasize, and I think you know, Rai was talking about some of the policies that we fight for or some things that we're pushing for. I would also like to add that our local police departments and city councils can actually start doing things like having crisis responders so that police are not the only first responders to every situation. There are numerous examples across the country where we have mental health professionals, social workers, actually be the people who are responding to things of homelessness, to drug addiction, and they actually have, and they can respond to that more quickly. They can do it with their specialties and their own professionalization a lot more effectively and more efficiently, just economically speaking. And it's a more humane way of doing that. I think that's one thing that we are really pushing for. Also pushing for actually restricting the 1033 program and the fact that a lot of our police departments have militarized weapons and technologies in our streets. If you have something like a, a tank or an armored vehicle, which are meant for warfare, uh, last time I checked, there's not we're not having a war on our streets, and our, we're not should be having weapons of war over our citizens, over our brothers and sisters in the community. That's something that I, I believe in. I think that we all believe in. And lastly, when we think about the Heritage Act, I think about a lot of these monuments, right? As a historian, <laughs> understanding when they were put up to begin with. In South Carolina, South Carolina was a majority African American state until about 1930. And so a lot of these monuments were put up at a time when most of the citizens of the state were African American and were disfranchised. And so these monuments were put up without their say. And then all of a sudden, many years later, monuments that were put in to snub, to kind of rub in the face of the majority population of the state, oh, we, we have to keep them there because of history. And, you know, it's like, oh, I don't want to erase history. You know what? I'm not for erasing history either. But to say that Benjamin Tillman is the only way that you remember what happened in 1900 South Carolina is a disrespectful statement to make to the vast majority of the citizens of the state. To say that you need Wade Hampton III's monument to remember that Reconstruction Redemption happened, it's a disrespectful statement to make when you have someone like Robert Smalls here from this state 
an African-American man who liberated himself from enslavement, took a ship across Confederate lines, fought against the Confederacy, came back to his hometown in South Carolina as a legislator, and oh, we can't remember that Reconstruction happened or that history in the state happened without Benjamin Tillman or J. Marion Sims or Wade Hampton III is a disrespect to not just the history of South Carolina, but that period in history, which was a majority African-American state. So I, I do not abide by that. I do not accept that rationalization personally. It was wrong then and it is wrong now. Let me see. <laughs> let, me, let me take, I want to add one thing and that is if you have on there anywhere something about police reform, South Carolina is not going to address truthfully police reform until it has a truth investigation on the Orangeburg massacre. Now, many of you younger folk might not know because it was 50 years ago. But we go every year to raise the question about three college students, youth, young people, getting shot like fish in a barrel, that's all you can call it, using lethal weapons. The bullets were made to kill. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about lethal weapons. And South Carolina cannot deal with race relations until that matter has been cleared. I say it's the litmus test for the discussion the genuine discussion, discussion about race relations in the state of South Carolina. And we will always fall behind um, Alabama, Mississippi, and uh, Georgia in terms of reconciliation in race relations in South Carolina. That's I where we are. To, Dr. Sellers, thank you so much for that. Jennifer, yeah. we are out of time. Do you want us to take one more question or would you like us, do we need to wrap it up and, and have a heart out or you tell me? Well, why don't we actually see if, the, if uh, any of the panelists want to have any uh, last minute comments for one another, if there are any questions from the younger generation or any, any comments from the, from the older generation. I mean, you guys, we, did, we touched on all of our topics. Um, so the floor is open for you. Well, the only thing I would like to say is that I hope by the end of the year, my book will be ready and finished. Yes. Um, it's temporarily entitled, I Did the Right Thing, My Life in the Civil Rights Movement and Beyond. So I'm hoping that it will be on the bookshelves uh, by the end of uh, the year. So remember, Dee Dee Wright and I Did the Right Thing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Remember, if, if you're making a reference to somebody as being somebody who articulated burn, baby, burn, uh, you're getting a, 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 it's not historically sound. So uh, leave that alone. Whoever's trying to make that, that connection. That's, that's, one, no, that's no group. That's no individual that I know of. That's the newspaper and how of, they make topics for the page, titles for the page. How do you feel about that phrase outside agitator, Dr. Sellers? Uh, I don't mind that phrase because you see it's coming up again, mm -hmm. even with Black Lives Matter and the demonstrations that's going on. Everybody's talking about the outside agitators coming into my community and, and infiltrating the, uh, the demonstrations and all. Uh, that, that was always uh, something that was used by the white conservative South and police state and uh, you know they always look to blame something on somebody else coming in because my my Negroes are good Christians and uh, you know it took an outside agitator to come in and influence them to go try to register the vote. Uh, that's just a myth I mean in terms of what that is. They're not people that's coming in and twisting people's arms and making them go register the vote if you can tell them how they can benefit from registering vote and voting, then maybe, you know, they will take the initiative on, them, on their own. And that's what, they, they, they don't give local people credit for being intelligent. And I think that when it comes down to finding ways in which we solve problems and all that kind of stuff, if we start with the people who are in the fix that they might be in, poverty, for an example, 
You know, there are crusades now that's starting out around the issue of poverty again. And we have to remember that that's when Dr. King was assassinated, when he was talking about poverty and, and the uh, sanitation workers out there in, in Memphis. So it's, it's, it's like we have shifted. We've done some good things. We had a feel good. And everybody felt like they were free. Black folk felt like they were free. And guess what? They discovered as, as recently as yesterday that it, it ain't quite so. It's but I think also, speaking of outside agitators, uh, you need to find some, some uh, combat for that to say, you know, Webster defines an agitator as something that gets the dirt out. You know, you don't have to go to a, a long dialogue of that, you know. If you if you got an agitator in there, it, it's going to get the dirt out. So don't get don't worry about that. You know, help is always needed. That's right. Does anybody want to clarify the difference between protesting and rioting, just for people out there listening, so they can understand uh, that there is a difference? Well, rioting is the com uh, nomenclature of the police. That's always going to be the case. I think it was Dr. King that said, um, and, and we call them rebellions. We tried to change the definition for what they were. But he said that those are the voices of the underclass, the oppressed, those in poverty, those who don't have the right to vote. That's what you hear when somebody strikes a match to some, something and, and, and light it up. And, and we have to look at it in this context. Uh, most of, of black folk don't own anything. You know, we, we had more property back when we started the movement in the 1960s, or that wing of the, or that period of the movement, than we have now. Um, in terms of wealth, uh, the white community has doubled the amount of wealth that they have over black people in the last 30 or 40 years. So we have to move away from just talking about those kinds of, of economic and trying to become a billionaire. Chances are um, most of our young people growing up right now will never reach that, that, uh, that height. And so we need to tell them about doing something else. That's just like walking in and you're seeing a, a, a little boy that his mom is is four foot 11, his father is five foot three, and he says he wants to be a center in the NBA. You need to start then telling him that he needs to have another set of goals in mind. Maybe he could be a, a small doctor, a lawyer, an Indian chief, but uh, being a basketball player is not gonna be his cup of tea. And we need to be honest in how we do that kind of thing. I, I like us encouraging people. But when you hear them talking about things that just won't happen, we need to be realistic and we need to be truthful with our kids, and we aren't. And that's where the, that's where the, the bond comes in. And the other thing, if anybody is over 70 years old, your days for marching and all is going to be on a short march, you know, about a block. That's going to be about what you can do. So don't, don't keep the other folk from marching by not turning the torch over. Give them the torch, give them the light, give them the encouragement, give them the boost, push them on down that street. And, and, and for you who represent that, that generation, that uh, Black Lives Matter generation and in the fight on the front lines, you have to understand that. And don't expect to get a pat on the back. Now, if you're looking for that, you need to get into another occupation or you need to get into another career, or you need to get into another field, because that you don't get a lot of those kinds of things. You know, I want to say to I want to say to each it. one of them, may I? Each each one of you, I'm I'm very proud of you, each and every one of you. Do your work, do your yes. research, yes, and you will be successful. Yes, it, it, it doesn't matter whether I think you're successful. I have no problems with Black, Black Lives Matter. I support you 100% and I want you to continue because again, we, we, are, we are weaving some fabric here. I said that earlier. Yes. And we have a big quilt that is yes. gonna to have to cover us all. That's so right. go about your work and do it and do it to the best of your ability. 
And I want to thank everybody for joining this conversation. This has just been a delight. And we have a lot of questions and a lot of chat. So I'm hoping that there is maybe a way that we can get Dr. Sellers and Ms. Wright and you know, DJ Jasmine, uh, Rye, if you guys wanna be able to comment in those chats, um, I'm sure that'd be very helpful for a lot of people. I know Dr. Donaldson started this conversation remembering um, the late Congressman John Lewis. And I just wanna be able to end with a quote from him. He said that nonviolence wasn't a tactic. It was a way of life. It was embracing the biblical prescription that one must love one's enemies. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.